Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'd like to welcome you to today's presentation for the Congressional Biomedical Research Caucus. I'd like to start by thanking uh, our co-chairs of the caucus, and that would be Representative Steve Stivers from Ohio, Representative Charlie Dent from Pennsylvania, Representative Jackie Spear from California, and Representative Rush Holt from New Jersey. And it's their commitment, dedication, and ongoing support that allows these caucuses to continue. Today we will be hearing from Dr. Alana Welm from the Huntsman Cancer Institute um, in Utah. Dr. Welm will be discussing research she and her lab has worked on that looks into more tailored treatments for specific types of breast cancer. She is here to highlight the advances seen in personalized medicine and the challenges we still have to face. Dr. Welm is an investigator, at, as mentioned, at the Huntsman Cancer Institute and is associate professor at the Department of Oncology Sciences at the University of Utah, where her laboratory is entirely focused on breast cancer metastasis. In fact, her discoveries on breast cancer metastasis have made her internationally known. So it is my pleasure today to welcome Dr. Welm. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn, for that um, nice introduction and also for the opportunity to be here to tell you about some of my favorite things to think about. Okay, so as mentioned, today I'm going to be talking to you about um, personalized medicine in, in breast cancer. Uh, and I'll start by just uh, giving you a, a little background about where I'm at. Um, not a lot of people, I think, uh, know that much about the Huntsman Cancer Institute. Uh, we are a, an NCI designated cancer center, uh, and we serve most of the Intermountain West. Uh, the closest other uh, NCI designated cancer center uh, to us is at about 500 miles away in, in Denver. So uh, we, of course, treat all types of cancer. We um, have a, a dedicated research facility that's adjacent to our hospital, and so that allows us to uh, have really nice close collaborations with, with our clinicians and our patients. And then, as many people know, we're actually uh, internationally known for the Utah Population Database. So um, as part of the uh, uh, genetic um, discoveries that have been made at University of Utah, uh, investigators uh, there discovered the breast cancer susceptibility genes, BRCA1, BRCA2, colon cancer susceptibility genes like APC, um, P16 and melanoma, and many, many, many more. And that's because of access to these huge uh, genealogical databases that are connected with birth records, death records, and uh, hospital records. So uh, our breast cancer program here at the uh, Huntsman Cancer Institute serves a huge geographical area, as I mentioned before. And I'll be uh, telling you about some of the things that we've done that are actually um, really very exciting because we were uh, the first, actually, in the world to do some of this work. So uh, we're, we're very um, proud of our accomplishments, but we, there really are a lot of challenges that we need to uh, continue to pursue. So I'll start just by... Um, <clears throat> giving some information about breast cancer for those of you who are fortunate enough not to know this um, very well through a family member or a loved one. Uh, there are 1.3 million new cases of breast cancer worldwide, about 250,000 every year in the U.S. alone, and 450,000 deaths every year, and about 10% of those are here in the U.S. The lifetime risk for women in the U.S. is one in eight of developing breast cancer. That means if you live a full uh, life expectancy, one in eight women will develop breast cancer. Now, um, despite the vast heterogeneity of this disease, which I'll focus on in great detail later, there are really only three basic types in terms of therapeutic treatment. So the first is the most common, and that is the estrogen receptor, progesterone receptor positive uh, subtype of breast cancer. Now these are the best prognosis uh, for breast cancer because they can be successfully treated many, much of the time with hormone modulating therapies like, like tamoxifen. Uh, and depending on the degree of, of um, sort of how that tumor looks, uh, the oncologist might decide to include chemo chemotherapy and, or radiation as well. Uh, there's also a type of breast cancer that overexpresses the HER2 oncogene, and these breast cancers are predominantly driven through that pathway, and that's important because as of uh, the mid-90s, there's an FDA-approved drug that, ta uh, that targets the HER2 protein called Herceptin, uh, and that is almost always given together with chemotherapy because it's a it's very um, aggressive type of breast cancer. And then there are the, um, about 10 to 15% of breast cancers that don't express any of these three markers, 
so-called triple negative disease or basal-like breast cancers, and these uh, are the, the deadliest of breast cancers. So we have no targeted therapy. The only thing uh, no, or available for these patients is chemotherapy and radiation. Now, based on current practice, however, breast cancer patients are heavily overtreated uh, with uh, therapy. And the reason why that is, is because we just don't know which of those tumors are going to be the ones that come back as a relapse, a metastatic relapse, and those that won't. So uh, we tend to err on the safe side. So we treat, as I, I'll mention later, about 10 patients with chemotherapy for the benefit of three. Now, that's important because chemotherapy, as you know, is incredibly toxic and comes with associated morbidities, uh, not only the well-known ones like nausea, vomiting, hair loss, et cetera, but also uh, serious damage to the heart, for example, with the most commonly used chemotherapy in breast cancer. Uh, and, and, you know, new cancers uh, can form as a result of treatment with these uh, drugs. <clears throat> So um, what, how is, what's the natural history of breast cancer look like? So if we look at the data from 1975, and I pulled this from the American Cancer Society statistics, if you look at the incidence of breast cancer, so the number of diagnoses over the years, um, what you can see is that it has risen. Now, in large part, that increased incidence is due to the advent of mammography screening in the mid-70s, where um, we're now able to find breast cancer earlier, and therefore more diagnoses are made. Um, in addition, you can see that this um, strong increase sort of flattened off, or even in some cases decreased, um, with the advent of less menopausal hormone use in the mid-90s because it was found that some of these hormones are actually contributing to, to breast cancer. Now, what's incredibly striking to me are the mortality statistics. So this is the number of people who die every year from this disease. And what you can see, I hope you can appreciate, that line is incredibly flat. It is decreasing, about 2% per year. Um, so we are making progress, and most of that progress can be attributed to the FDA approval of tamoxifen and other hormone modulating therapies starting from the mid-70s. Um, and then, as I mentioned, our, other, our only other targeted therapy for breast cancer, which is Herceptin, approved in uh, the mid-90s. So, so as I said, the mortality rates are going down. Uh, and that they're going down less in the African-American population compared to the Caucasian population. Um, but we have a lot of work to do. If the same number, approximately the same number of people are dying today as in 1970, uh, that, I think, means we still, we still have a lot of work uh, to do. Now, um, before I go into personalized therapy, I thought I would just give you an overview of a typical treatment regime for a breast cancer patient. So unlike many types of cancers, upon diagnosis, um, the, the first step is usually surgery. And that can be mastectomy, removing the whole breast, or lumpectomy, uh, where just the tumor is removed along with some margins of normal breast. Um, and, but if the tumor is very, very large or a special case like inflammatory breast cancer where there's not really a defined lump, uh, sometimes patients will be given chemotherapy prior to surgery to help shrink that tumor uh, in order to allow for successful excision. Now, after surgery, um, the pathologist will be able to stage the disease. So that includes an assessment uh, not only of the three molecular markers I told you about already, but also um, things like the size of the tumor, whether or not there are lymph nodes that have tumor in them. So lymph nodes, of course, drain that tissue. So those lymph nodes can be examined for a tumor. And if it's present, that suggests that the tumor has begun to spread. Uh, and whether or not there's distant disease, so metastatic disease in other organs. So the most localized type of breast cancer is stage one, and then it goes through stage two, three, all the way to stage four, which is metastatic disease. Now stage four, or metastatic breast cancer, whether it's present at the time of diagnosis or whether it recurs as metastatic cancer 20 years later, is incurable. So uh, there is no known therapy that can cure metastatic breast cancer or pretty much any metastatic cancer. Uh, and so the strategy is really to um, do as much as one can to prolong the survival time, uh, but it's not considered curable. 
Okay, so after surgery, uh, and, and after we know the ERPR HER2 status of a tumor, as well as the stage of the tumor, uh, then um, there is an option of adjuvant therapy. So adjuvant therapy, the whole point is, if this tumor has metastasized before we took it out, then um, let's kill it. So this is to kill any uh, undetectable met metastatic disease. So, and that therapy will vary depending on the type of tumor. So, as I mentioned before, a large percentage, 60 or 70 percent of breast cancers are ERPR positive. So they depend on signaling through estrogen and progesterone uh, through these receptors. And so they're going to get hormone-modifying therapy for five years. That's to help kill anything that might have already spread and is still in the body. Now, depending on the stage of that disease, they may also get chemotherapy uh, in addition or before they get their hormone therapy. Now, 15 to 20 percent of breast cancers are HER2 positive, and because they have that target, then they are, those patients um, are, will be given Herceptin as, as a targeted therapy, and that will always follow chemotherapy because uh, these are very, very aggressive therapies, or very, very aggressive cancers. So they get chemotherapy, then Herceptin for one year. Now, um, I mentioned before the toxicities of chemotherapy. Herceptin uh, is a relatively safe drug compared to chemotherapy, but it does come with cardiotoxicity. So people who are taking Herceptin have to have um, echocardiograms frequently to make sure that there is not damage uh, to the heart. About 10 to 15 percent of all breast cancers are these triple negative subtypes, so they don't have any of the targets that we have for targeted therapy. That means their only option is chemotherapy, um, and, so, and so those are treated. So after this adjuvant therapy, that's it. You're done. So when I first started at Huntsman, I started um, spending some time in the clinic because I'm a basic scientist and I wanted to learn more about the clinical disease so that I could ask questions that I thought were most relevant to making progress in, in this disease. And what I was shocked to find is that many of my assumptions were not true. So I, I had assumed that once someone completes their therapy, they would be followed over time to see if they would develop any metastatic disease, right? Because the, the logic is that if you find it earlier, you can do more about it and the patient would live longer. But that's not the case. There are so many breast cancer patients, uh, even just in the U.S., we're talking about 250,000 new diagnoses every year, not to mention those that have been diagnosed in years past that are still surviving. Um, they, they cannot possibly be screened uh, like, say, by CT scan um, on a regular basis. It would just cost too much money for our, our health care system. But what really struck me is, is the medical oncologist told me, we don't want to know if they're there because we can't do anything about it. We, we, we don't have a curative therapy, and, uh, you know, we're just going to start treating them with more chemotherapy, but ultimately there's no data that says that looking for these metastases earlier prolongs the life of patients. So uh, that, that was very, very uh, surprising to me, but really started me thinking. And because I work on metastasis, I, I started to think about this where if, if someone's diagnosed, oops, sorry, if someone is, is diagnosed, they undergo surgery, the surgeons are very good at getting all the tumor out. Sometimes they have to go back and get a little more, but, but really uh, we don't have a problem with recurrence at the local site. Uh, but Sometimes 10 years later, 20 years later, these patients pop up with metastatic disease. Since their tumor never came back, that means that disease was there, right? They, it had spread before you even found your first tumor and had it removed. So those things have been laying dormant uh, in your body for anywhere from one to 20 plus years. And so to me, that's a really interesting question because that, that says, you know, how is it that, that these tumor cells live that long without being detected? Uh, how is it that they remain dormant for that much time? And then how is it that they decide finally to grow out? Um, we can't detect them until they're about a centimeter. So typically the first time that they're um, found is because of a, a symptom. So dizziness, if there's brain metastases, um, a fracture because there's bone metastases or uh, difficulty breathing because of lung metastases, et cetera. So um, these relapses then occur in all types of breast cancer. They can occur. So in the safest breast cancers, as I told you, the ERPR positive, 
it's about 20 to 30 percent of those patients who, following adjuvant therapy, will relapse. Uh, and uh, that can happen in ER positive disease, that can happen on the late end of the scale. So, ER positive tumors are very good at hiding out in the body for up to 20 years. And then they pop out, usually in bones, um, liver, lung, and brain. Now, um, about 15% of the HER2 positive cancers, despite treatment with chemotherapy and then Herceptin to kill any of these undetectable metastases, uh, will pop up with relapse. Uh, and all of those essentially are, are resistant to Herceptin. And so then they're back to, we have nothing but chemotherapy for those, for those patients. Um, the triple negative cancers, as I mentioned, are the deadliest, so more than half of those will relapse despite adjuvant chemotherapy. And when they do that, they typically relapse within five years. So the interesting thing is that unlike ER-positive breast cancer, where one can really never be certain that their disease won't come back, if, you're, if you have a triple negative tumor or you had a triple negative tumor, and you don't have anything recurring in the first five years, or typically it's the first three years, then statistics say that it will not recur. Uh, so, so it's an uh, interesting uh, different biology of that cancer. Now once uh, metastatic relapse happens, um, then it, it really is just trial and error. Like I said, it's not curable. So the oncologist will go through different uh, therapies based on what the patient can tolerate, what seems to be working. They'll stay on it till it stops working. They'll go on something else and, and just keep going. And that's the kind of thing that I think in my lab we're most interested in trying to address. Uh, and, and in particular, that's because, as I mentioned, in the, the problem of metastasis happened before you ever found your tumor. So the idea, in my mind, of blocking a tumor from spreading, uh, is, it, it's too late. The horse is out of the barn unless we can get even earlier detection. So, so for me, the interesting issue biologically and the most clinically relevant issue is how do we prevent this relapse? Uh, and that's the, that's the thing that I'm very fascinated by. Okay, so as I said before, cytotoxic chemotherapy, we treat 10 patients for the benefit of three. So, and the reason why is because we do not know whose cancer is going to relapse and whose is not. So we treat, you know, if, if I had cancer, I would probably have chemotherapy because I, I don't want to take the risk of, of having a metastatic relapse that's incurable. However, targeted therapy, so th that's therapy that's not just general cytotoxic therapy, but it actually is given to block a particular protein or other um, entity in, in the tumor, um, is, is less toxic because it's targeted, um, and it's potentially more effective. Uh, the problem with that, and, and that's true for um, hormone modulating uh, th therapy, uh, given when there's ER and PR present in the tumor, or Herceptin, if there's HER2 positive, uh, if the tumor's HER2 positive, um, but you have to know what to target. So this is the whole concept of personalized medicine, or the new trendy word is, uh, is precision medicine. So this issue of personalized medicine, uh, oncologists would, would argue that that has been long utilized. This isn't a new thing. Uh, so we hear about it a lot in the popular press, but really, um, you know, in specialty fields of medicine like oncology, uh, personalized medicine has been used. And that, that examples in breast cancer, as I've already, I think, uh, talked about is, is you know, uh, we look at individual, every single person's tumor uh, to look at, you know, the, how those cells look, that gives you a grade, whether it's microinvasive, that gives you, um, helps give you stage information, that you look in that person's lymph nodes to see if the tumor has spread, and you modulate treatment based on that. Um, and of course, testing for these molecular markers um, are, is personalized, because if you have ER positive tumor, you're gonna get this therapy. If you don't, you won't get that therapy. Um, another example is testing for BRCA1 and 2 mutations. These are the um, breast cancer susceptibility genes that we know about. Um, and in high-risk families, people are often tested for these mutations because then they can consider prophylactic treatment. And that might be prophylactic mastectomy before they develop breast cancer, prophylactic um, ovarectomy um, before they develop ovarian cancer, or even uh, now considering, rather than surgery, treatment with things like tamoxifen uh, to help uh, prevent these things from growing out. 
So what's new? Uh, you know, what's new? What's the new buzz now about personalized medicine in breast cancer? Well, it kind of centers around genomics as well as so-called pharmacogenetics. Now, pharmacogenetics is just like it sounds. It's combining a drug treatment or pharmacology based on the genetic profile of you or your tumor. Um, and that is an idea because now if we know something about that tumor, maybe we can um, predict drug response. So examples of that include, again, people with BRCA1 or 2 mutant cancers um, might be more susceptible to PARP inhibitors, or these are inhibitors of DNA repair, because the mutation in those tumors makes the DNA unable to repair itself. That's why you get tumors. And if you then further block that, they, they die. They can't survive. Um, and another would be PI3 kinase or PIK3CA mutations in breast cancer. Um, they will be more likely to respond to a therapy that's targeting that particular gene. So, so that's kind of what's new. Now, I'm sure all of you are familiar with the National Cancer Institute's uh, Cancer Genome Atlas Project, where um, the NIH has invested $275 million so far um, to basically sequence and study more than 11,000 cancers across more than 20 different types of cancer, including breast cancer. Now, they're not only sequencing them, but they're also doing uh, DNA methylation assays, DNA copy number, uh, gene expression, microRNA expression, and protein analysis. So it's like a full assessment of all of these cancers. Uh, so the data was published in Nature last year um, on the TCGA data for breast cancer, and I was just going to try to summarize that for you here. So um, what was incredibly striking is that there were mutations found in only three genes. So P53, the so-called guardian of the genome, P3 kinase that I just mentioned, and a transcription factor called GATA3 that occurred at more than 10 percent incidence across breast cancers. So only three genes are commonly mutated uh, when you look at all, all these different breast cancers. However, we had hundreds and hundreds of other mutations that occur at frequencies of 1 percent or less, and most of those are at frequencies of 0.01 percent. So in other words, we didn't find brand new genes that are going to really, um, you know, tell us now how to treat this cancer or this cancer or this cancer. What we found is that every tumor is different. Every tumor has hundreds of mutations, and those mutations are very unlikely to be common between my tumor and someone else's tumor. And so this raises a huge issue in terms of how we're going to understand the biology of the cancer as well as how we're going to better treat it. So um, we talk a lot in, in uh, science about driver mutations and passenger mutations. So of those hundreds of genes that are mutated in your tumor versus your normal blood, so this is not to, cannot be explained by normal genetic variation, uh, we, we don't know which ones are actually driving the cancer versus those that just happened on accident uh, and, and aren't actually going to matter. Right? So we don't want to target the passengers because we don't expect that there would be an effect. Not only that, but all of these hundreds of mutations, we, we don't have corresponding therapies for most of them, nor do we even know how to tar make a therapy that targets certain types of genes or gene products. <clears throat> However, it's not that we didn't learn anything, because that had to be done. We know cancer is a disease of genetics, uh, and we know that in many cancers, genetics are the major drivers, and in fact, in glioblastoma and ovarian cancer, this project was incredibly successful at being able to identify new oncogenes that were targetable and, in fact, have, have um, led to patient benefit already. Um, in breast cancer, however, it's much more complicated. And it's a very, very heterogeneous collection of diseases. However, with all of this data, uh, they were able to, to identify essentially four general uh, classes of breast cancer, uh, which might integrate, even though there's a lot of mutations, they might integrate particular pathways that then could be targetable. So even though there might be, you know, 20 different ways to mutate your genome in order to get the PI3 kinase pathway active, or the MAP kinase pathway active. Ultimately, if that's the commonality, then maybe we can target those pathways. So that's kind of where we are now. It's pathway integration and systems biology that will be really important. 
But because every tumor is different, um, and in a, in a way, this data, which was from almost 2,000 breast cancers and normal tissue from the same patient, the normal blood sequence, um, it, it sort of validates the fact, our, our experimental findings, meaning our, our clinical research findings of incredibly varied responses to different drugs. Different patients have different responses. Um, and um, also why, again, in breast cancer, we can't figure out which tumors are the worst ones, and that's why we have to treat so many people. Um, so, so my question with this is, you know, I believe that we need some kind of functional assessment of therapy response to each tumor. I don't think that knowing the DNA sequence is enough to tell us what it is that we should target. So in some diseases, it is enough because we could say, you know, this, you know, certain leukemias, for example, are very much driven by one gene, one driver that if you block it and, you know, BCR able or the target of Gleevec, for example, is a good, good example of this in CML. If you block it, you can essentially cure most of those patients. There is some problems with resistance, and, and that's being dealt with as well. But breast cancer looks like it's not one of those diseases. It's incredibly complicated. So my idea of precision medicine is, is not just sequencing everybody, but it is trying to combine that with some functional data that says which drugs are best for that person. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about um, what we've done in our lab. And we're not the only ones doing this. So, so there was an article uh, last year in the New York Times that highlighted some of our work, as well as a, a company that is, um, is uh, taking a similar approach. And now there are multiple companies doing this. And the idea is um, to the use of so-called mouse avatars. I did not coin that term. <laughs> I call them tumor grafts. Uh, the idea is that you take the tumor from a, individual patients and you graft them into an immune-compromised mouse so they can grow in the mouse. And then we can treat that mouse with a bunch of different therapies, of course, because it's multiple mice. And we try to determine which ones are most effective. So using that in combination with the genomics or genetics of someone's tumor, to me, would be more effective than just the genetics alone. Uh, and so uh, one of the companies that's doing that was uh, developed by um, Dr. Sidransky, who, who is at Hopkins, um, but he's the co-founder and chairman of Champions Oncology. And, and just looking at, at that website, you know, he thinks this is a key enabler of personalized medicine where you can actually determine the right drug for the right patient at the right time. Now, um, I, I've looked extensively into this company. I've had lots of phone calls with them. We, we've uh, talked a lot about our data because they don't really do breast cancer. They do more pancreatic and GI cancers, lung cancer, et cetera. Uh, and actually, um, they have had pretty amazing success, I have to say. So where they've had patients with pancreatic cancer, which has a dismal prognosis, usually, uh, you know, one to two years, um, and grafted that patient's tumor into multiple mice, tested something like 20 different th combination therapies, found the one that works best, and the patient's still alive six years later. Uh, so things like that, that, that there is a lot of promise in this. Um, but our goal, of course, was not to do this commercially. Our goal was to see whether for breast cancer we could use a model like this in order to um, improve uh, models of therapeutic response. And uh, nobody had ever done breast cancer before. They, there were some attempts with some different models, but ultimately they didn't quite recapitulate the disease. And so um, what we did, again, uh, with the goal in mind of not only just building better uh, breast cancer models, um, moving from the clinic to the lab, but also trying to translate from, from what we can find in those models back to improve uh, clinical outcomes. What we did was we um, isolated uh, breast tumors from patients as they were undergoing mastectomy or lumpectomy, if they agreed to be involved in our study. And we implanted them directly into the mammary gland of the mouse. And the reason why we chose that is because we thought that that would be an environment that would be most like the human breast. Uh, and then because mice don't make as much estrogen as, as uh, women do, we also supplemented the ER positive tumors with an estrogen pellet that would secrete estrogen. What we found was that we actually, it worked. <laughs> um, and these grafts actually represented 
represented all of the molecular subtypes of breast cancer seen in patients with the exception of one, the luminal A subtype, which is the ERPR positive that responds very well to hormone therapy and survival is something like 95%. So we couldn't get those to grow. I'll tell you why in a second. Um, we got tumors to grow that were from chemo-naive primary tumors at the very beginning of diagnosis, and we also got um, tumors to grow from metastatic um, patients who were progressing on therapy. So these are really treatment uh, resistant. Um, we developed, um, oops, as I mentioned, estrogen-dependent um, ERPR-positive grafts. We, we can serially transplant them from one mouse to the next or one mouse into 20 or 40 so that we can do some um, functional assays. Um, and the nice thing is we can also freeze these tumor fragments um, as viable specimens so that we, we don't have to constantly keep them going in mice. We can just um, we can freeze them back. That's also how we ship them out to other labs. So we've shipped them out to more than 100 different labs across the world now. Um, as these little viable specimens, which makes it a lot easier than shipping live animals. Um, and the most impressive thing um, about these tumors was that they are so high fidelity in terms of retaining their histopathology and their um, behavior that our clinical breast pathologists cannot actually tell me, when I give them a section on a slide, they can't tell me whether it's from the patient or from the mouse unless we do particular stains. So, so they really look like the, the original tumor. And uh, we also showed that with genomics and gene expression as well. Um, but the really nice thing for my studies is that they're spontaneously metastatic. So the problem with breast cancer cell lines that have been used for decades, um, they are ex incredibly good tools for understanding, you know, pathways involved in cancer, uh, doing biochemistry, and all of those things. They've, they've been phenomenal. But when you put them in a mouse and you want to ask something about metastasis, which requires a whole animal system, because you're asking a tumor to migrate from one place to another organ, uh, they, don't, they don't do it. And part of the reason uh, for it, taking these tumors and putting them directly in the mouse instead of culturing them was uh, th thinking that maybe if we do that and we skip the culture step, we will be able to, or the tumors will, will retain their ability to metastasize. And in fact, they did. So um, they did spontaneously metastasize, so now we had metastatic models. But even better, they metastasized to sites where the patient had metastasis. So for example, the only bone mets we ever saw in our mice were from patients who also had bone mets. Uh, and same thing with lung and, and lymphatics, et cetera. <clears throat> so, so that suggests that we're actually retaining the biology of these tumors pretty well in, in, this, um, in this assay. So um, here's just a, a description of the experiment, which is published, so, so I'm not going to go into a lot of detail here. But um, our first study, we enrolled 46 women who were, um, you know, consented at the University of Utah or Huntsman Cancer Institute. We implanted their tumors into mice, and what we found was that 70% of them never grew and 30% grew. So not everyone's tumor grows in a mouse, and we knew this would be difficult because others had tried it in the past, and hormone-dependent cancers are very tricky to do in a different species. Um, but what was amazing is that the ones that grow, um, the patient outcome was really bad. So we actually only have one patient still living uh, from everyone whose tumor grew. The patients whose tumor did not grow um, lived very, very well, and the, only, I think only one person has died actually out of that group. So that actually told us something. <laughs> it said that we're asking, well, we knew we were asking a lot for these tumors to grow in, in a mouse, right? But it says that only the most aggressive tumors grow in the mouse. In hindsight, that makes perfect sense, but we hadn't expected that. We hadn't thought about that. Um, and in fact, this is independent of the ER status, ERPR HER2 status. It's independent of the size of the tumor. It's independent of the grade. It's even independent of whether it was metastatic or primary. So, so that just tells us that this assay, this functional assay, is actually giving us more information than we would have got, than, than what we normally get clinically with all the standard of care assessment. So that was a big surprise. That, that was not um, expected necessarily. Um, but now the idea is of those ones that grow, now we know these are really, oops, terribly aggressive tumors. Um, and so now can we actually transplant those into cohorts of mice, test different therapies, and then hopefully 
um, prevent this metastatic relapse by either altering or uh, prescribing a more effective adjuvant therapy or by even treating the disease upon metastatic relapse. So um, I'm going to give you one example of a patient just to sort of give you an idea of how this, how this goes. So this patient, um, HCI5, is, is, well, was, uh, she's since passed away. So um, her tumor was triple positive. So it was ERPR positive and HER2 positive. She chose to have a lumpectomy, um, and she had radiation at the site to prevent local recurrence. And she had hormone therapy for five years and her septum for one year. So very standard therapy. Um, she, she also had chemotherapy as well. Um, about 10 years later, her tumor relapsed in the lung. She had lung mets. She then also developed bone mets. And uh, she had a pleural effusion, which is where the sac around the lung gets filled with fluid. It makes it hard to breathe. And so the, the treatment for that is to basically tap that pleural cavity so that you can remove all that fluid. And that fluid is just loaded with cancer cells. So we actually didn't have her initial tumor because she wasn't seen initially at our hospital. This was 10 years ago. Uh, but when she came um, in 2007, we, we got some of that pleural effusion when they tapped her, and we grew a graft out of it in the mice. Uh, on that same day that she got tapped and we got the cancer cells, the doctor uh, changed her prescription uh, to try to tackle this metastatic disease by giving her a combination of paclitaxel and Herceptin. So paclitaxel is a cytotoxic chemotherapy um, and, and Herceptin. Now, um, she was also on a hormone modulating therapy and a bone metastatic uh, agent called Zomata, which is a, a bisphosphonate to prevent bone loss. We didn't um, do an experiment with those two drugs, um, the Zomata or the um, hormone modulating therapy, because that was not something that had changed over the course of her treatment. So we wanted to ask, you know, um, is her tumor going to be responsive to paclitaxel or Herceptin? Now, of course, this was all done in, in a de-identified manner. So we, we don't know her name. We know we have a, a de-identified number for her, and we have links to her chart. Um, but we're not, the goal here was not to change her therapy based on what we find in the lab. That would be a prospective trial that we have to do now in the future. So this was all done retrospectively. Um, what happened is, OK, so the doctor put her on a combination of paclitaxel and Herceptin. That worked. So she actually had stable disease for eight months, meaning she didn't have to get tapped for her pleural effusion weekly like she had been before because there were so many cancer cells. So that combination worked. But unfortunately, eight months later, she relapsed again and had very aggressive uh, disease again in the pleural cavity. We got two more samples from her about one week apart um, that we call HCI6 and HCI7. And then she died a couple months after that, unfortunately. <clears throat> So we did the experiment where we grafted her, her, well, we grafted all of these, obviously, but the first experiment was to say HCI5 tumor, we know in the patient, responded well to this combination, right? So what about our mice? Could, do we get that effect? So we grafted these in mice, and here's just showing you the average tumor growth over time. Um, the control group shown here in light blue, uh, these mice only got saline, and you can see the rate of tumor growth. What we saw was that the Herceptin actually increased the growth of the tumor, um, which we expected it would be resistant to Herceptin because she had already had that as adjuvant therapy, and these still grew out. Uh, however, paclitaxel, shown in red, or the combination of paclitaxel and Herceptin uh, a lot, uh, caused tumor shrinkage. And that's after one dose. You can see it shrinks, that, and it starts to grow. We give another dose, and it shrinks again. So that suggested that it's actually the taxol that was working in her tumor, not the Herceptin and not the combination. Uh, and in fact, um, that's true because when we when to do the same experiment on HCI6, they all grow. So if we just look again at the paclitaxel only, um, just to show you some of the individual mice. Um, so this was, so if you take someone's tumor, you get little fragments of it and you put it into, let's say, five different mice. Every one of those mice might be carrying a different piece, of, well, is carrying a different piece of the tumor, and that might be a different subset of the tumor that's growing in the mouse. And um, what we found, in fact, again with HCI5, is that this um, piece of tumor was completely resistant to taxol. 
So we had given the taxol upon um, the, uh, at these black arrows, whereas these mice had pieces of the tumor that were initially uh, very responsive. So every time we give the taxol, the tumor shrinks. And that's also true um, here, although after a while, we, this one actually stopped being sensitive and became resistant, which is something that was well known in cancer biology. So what this says is that even though her tumor overall was responding to taxol early on, there were pieces of it that were resistant. And that is likely what led to her final relapse uh, and, and uh, eventual death. Now, um, when we test HCI 6 or 7 for these drugs, they're, they're completely resistant, which makes sense because we know they're progressing in that patient on that therapy. And we decided to test some new drugs. So um, I, although I don't have time to talk about it today, my, the major part of my lab is actually working on a particular pathway called the RON signaling pathway that we believe is very important in metastatic breast cancer. So we've been working for a long time with funding from the AACR and other um, other uh, foundations and the NIH to try to develop inhibitors or test inhibitors of that pathway. So we, we decided, okay, we've got this really aggressive uh, tumor. Let's treat it with a RON inhibitor and see what happens. Um, and so here, this, this one is called uh, BMS 777607, also known as Aslan002. And here are mice growing her most aggressive tumor, HCI7. Oops, sorry. Um, and the, the mice shown here in black are the mice that receive just control, um, placebo, basically. Um, and then here are the ones in the red are the ones that got the RON inhibitor. So three out of four mice that got this RON inhibitor were actually cured. So at, at this point, we took them off drug, and we followed them for another month, and the tumor never came back. So that's actually a really remarkable response in, in a mouse. Um, however... There is one piece of the tumor growing in this mouse that, um, you know, seems to be a bit resistant to this drug. And so if I had to guess what would happen is if, if a patient were to get a compound like this, again, there would be a nice response for some period of time, but eventually you'd select for the one that's resistant and it would, it would grow out. So this is the constant problem we have in oncology is trying to keep up with these tumors that are constantly changing. Um, but suggest that maybe, um, you know, we can use mice to test new therapies that even when other therapies are not working. So with that, I'm just going to summarize, um, and then we'll have some time for questions. Uh, I, so increased breast cancer screening is important because we can detect cancer early, but still 20 to 30 percent of breast cancers will still develop incurable relapses or metastases. Um, it's such a varied collection of diseases, so we have to do this in a more individualized or personalized manner. Uh, however, I don't think sequencing everybody is the answer. I think we need to do, combine that with functional studies, so we still have a lot of work to, go, uh, to do. Um, and uh, these patient-derived tumor graphs can actually maybe be a, a new way that we can do this. Uh, the challenge is, is that it is um, you know, expensive, it's time-consuming, uh, and, and we're going to need a lot of uh, work. And ultimately, we need to do a prospective clinical trial to say, if I do an experiment where I grow your tumor in mice and I figure out what's the best drug, and then you get that drug, does it work, right? Does it tell us what, what is actually uh, responsible? And we're trying to raise funding right now to do that at our institute. So with that, I'll thank um, the people who actually did the tumor graft work, um, with special thanks to the HCI patients and physicians who participated. And then this is my current funding um, support. I get a lot of support for the, uh, from the DOD Breast Cancer Research Program, which is incredibly important for these kinds of high-risk, um, high-reward studies. Um, as well as the NCI and several uh, foundations. Um, and then I also had past uh, funding uh, from the AACR for the RON project, which I didn't have time to talk about. So with that, I'm happy to take any questions you might have. Why is breast tissue so um, vulnerable to cancer as opposed to some other tissues in the body? Yeah, so um, I think, could everybody hear the question? Okay, good. So why is breast cancer more susceptible? Breast tissue is interesting in that it um, is it is made to um, undergo huge rounds of proliferation with each pregnancy and with each estrus cycle, and then, um, and then it all has to die off with every 
at the end of estro every estrous cycle or every, at weaning of, of a child. And so it undergoes, there's a lot of stem cells in the tissue that are meant to undergo this huge expansion and then, and then dying off. And so it's thought that the number of estrous cycles that one goes through, so how early a menstrual period started, is known to be a risk factor for breast cancer. So the more um, estrous cycles you've gone through, the more expansion of your glands and the more chance for mutation. And then if they don't all die off, when it shrinks back down, then you have mutations that accumulate over time. But isn't it true that having, uh, that women who have never had a baby are more susceptible? That's true. So <laughs> it doesn't accept that. Um, it's, it's actually very complicated. So, so there is definitely a risk factor for early menarche. Um, and it is protective to have a child, but only if you have the child and complete the nursing and weaning process before the age of 30. Um, and so what's thought is that by having a child early um, and undergoing a full-term pregnancy and nursing and lactation and weaning, that you actually can eliminate a lot of those um, cells that might be mutated early on because of early estrus. Um, however, if you um, get breast cancer within <coughs> seven years of a pregnancy, the um, prognosis is worse. So breast cancer, I mean, so pregnancy is not always protective. It's, it's very, very complicated. And it's still an active area of research. Um, in terms of personalized medicine, I'm just wondering what you would say to, you know, like what kind of reimbursement or what kind of changes do there need to be in terms of uh, funding a clinical trial, like when you're, you're testing, where you know there's not going to be 100% response rate. You know, it's, it's going to be very targeted, and very minimal response rates, but it's going to be incredibly powerful in that. So how can we, you know, here at Capital Hill, change that uh, that message? I think I think the best. Um the best way to change that is, again, education, which is, you know, I'm so happy that you're all here because I think that's uh, really important to know that because the pharmaceutical companies are never going to have incentive to develop a drug that will only work for 1% of, you know, any kind of cancer patient, right? And so um, I think that, but if you can find that target, right, and you have a biomarker for hitting that target, so if you can select your cohort of patients up front that would be predicted to respond to your drug, so in my case, um, you know, if your tumor expresses RON, then that is, you know, more likely to be working for a RON inhibitor, um, then, they, then you can design trials more carefully, and then they'll be less expensive, and so hopefully that would help fuel the investment into it. I think this is going to be a huge issue going forward with personalized medicine because of our genetic diversity and tumors inherently are, are genetically diverse. So it, I agree with it. It's a, it's a big problem. It's very, very important. And I think, again, coming back to combining it with some kind of functional analysis is really important because just because you have mutation A does not, is not enough to say that you're going to respond to, you know, drug a prime, or <laughs> whatever. I mean, um, and unless you, you know, I would be much more comfortable going forward if I knew that I had actually tested that drug in some kind of a model, and I know that this tumor does respond to it. Um, so, so I think education is the key, and I think trying to get pharma. I, I think being very smart about the trials we do. Herceptin is a good example. So. 10 to 15 percent of patients are HER2 positive and would receive Herceptin. If they had done that trial on all breast cancer patients, it would have failed because it would not have shown a benefit. Uh, but because they selected it based on only those that expressed the target, it, it passed. So there was a lot of excitement recently about PARP inhibitors um, in triple negative breast cancer where we have no targeted therapy. Um, PARP inhibitors were originally shown to be very effective in BRCA mutant cancers. Now, BRCA mutant cancers tend to be triple negative, um, and BRCA mutant cancers are very rare, 1% of the population. So rather than design the trial to only treat 1% of patients, the BRCA mutant ones, they decided to do it with all triple negatives, including the BRCA mutants. That trial showed no benefit. It bombed. And what's worse, they didn't save samples from those patients so that now we can't even go back and say, why did this one respond and this one didn't? So 
smart trials, I think, are really, really key. So if I understood it right, it sounds like these tumor grafted mice will be really valuable in helping to determine what the appropriate therapy is for for a patient. But it sounds like there could be a real challenge in scaling that up. So how, how do you envision that actually being sort of implemented in clinical practice? So I think it is really challenged. So the, the first thing we have to do, I think, is a prospective trial to say, yes, this works, right? And so what we're trying to do right now at the Institute, and it's getting really hard. It's hard to get it funded. It's, it's very expensive. Um, it's, it's very tricky. Um, so once you know that um, it's a value, <laughs> you know, by, by doing the, uh, the trial, then I think um, the solution probably is not to graft everyone's tumor. Uh, so one of the things we've started doing, again, because we had those tumors that grew and those that didn't grow, and we know that correlates with prognosis, um, we've done, we've sequenced their whole genome and their RNA, so we know what the gene expression differences are. So in other words, can we come up with a molecular signature that tells us the tumor's going to grow versus not going to grow? So now instead of having to actually do the mouse experiment, you can actually look at the tumor and say, okay, this has a high chance of growing, therefore it's probably going to be aggressive. Let's grow that one, right? And not grow everybody's tumor, but only grow the 30% that, that we think um, are going to be really challenging. Um, but again, that also would have to be tested in a trial as well. So you get funding from both DOD and NCI. The question on the Hill these days is all about sequestration. Um, how is your work and the work in the field being affected by sequestration? Well, I mean, it's huge. <laughs> I think um, we know that in order to keep um, just, just the funding at the NCI level, we need an increase every year because of the increased costs of do doing research, et cetera. Um, the DOD program, the breast cancer program, for those of you who don't know about it, this is a separate pot of money that's allocated every year by Congress um, specifically for breast cancer research that's outside of the NIH pot. Now, that money is raised by advocates every single year. It's not guaranteed year after year. They have to go there every year. And last year, it's, it's on the order of about $120 million. And then that money is actually spent on uh, projects that the advocates feel will make a bigger impact. So it doesn't mean they don't fund basic science because everybody recognizes that basic science is really important to, to be able to make new drugs and to understand these pathways or these mutations, whatever it is. Um, but they, you have to be able to tell them how this would change, how this would impact basic science or clinical translation in breast cancer. So it has to be breast cancer focused. That, I think, that program is, is really at risk. <laughs> um, with sequestration on the DOD budget, I'm sure that it um, might not be considered a high priority um, in contrast to, you know, veterans' benefits or, or all of the other things that are on the chopping block. Um, but I would say that for my research, I mean, I couldn't have done this. The, absolutely no way I could have done this work with, with um, either NIH funding or any other funding, um, because it is so high risk, crazy idea, Frankenstein kind of, you know, stuff, the NIH would not fund that. Um, the NIH uh, budget is also extremely important, because that's what funds, you know, my basic science as well as future applications. And so now I've shown that the tumor graphs work. Now NCI is a little more willing to, to uh, fund that sort of thing. And in fact, there was an initiative um, out of Harold Varmus's office about these kind of graphs in breast cancer. So a group of us um, went to the NCI and, and, and talked about this. Um, and I think there was huge excitement for the potential in this field, but not really, we didn't really walk away with a consensus that said, this is how we're going to get it done. Um, it's going to require collaboration between lots of institutes. It's going to require a lot of money. Um, it's going to be, it's going to be challenging but the funding is absolutely key. Yeah. All right, thank you very much.